Would you lift your voice? And just reach out from your heart to him. Reach out from your heart to him. Reach out from your heart to him. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful end. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. So make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing. All you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Yes, Lord. That's our prayer tonight that you will bring a new wine out of us. That you will bring a new wine out of us. I should will bring a new wine out of us. I should will bring a new wine out of us. That you will bring a new wine out of us. That you will bring a new wine out of us. That you will bring a new wine out of us. Will bring a new life out of us. Oh Jesus, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Oh Jesus, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Say Jesus, Jesus, bring new wine. So where there is new wine, there is new power, there is no freedom, the kingdom is here, I lay down my offering, hey, come on sing it out, to carry your new fire, to take where there is new wine, there is new power, there is no freedom, the kingdom is here, oh, I lay down my overlay to carry the carry. There is new wine, there is new power, there is no freedom, freedom is here, I lay down my old flame, to carry 
your new fire. Carry a new fire. Today, where there is new wine, where there is new wine, there is new, there is new power. There is new freedom. The kingdom is here. prayer tonight that is our cry tonight that is our prayer tonight that is our prayer tonight that is our cry tonight that is our cry tonight if I take what a word has offered I have to come again Again and again Just one drink of his living water I never thirst again I never thirst again If I take what a word I offer I have to come again. I have to come again. Just one drink of his living water. I'll never thirst again. I'll never thirst again. Shake up the well, would never do. So I will draw from you. Uh, These are what would never do. So I will draw from Say Jacob's will would never do. So I will draw from you. Oh, oh. Jacob's will, Jacob's will.
she comes to us, she comes to us, I will never kiss, so I will drop from you, these old ones will never do, so I will drop from you, only you can satisfy my heart. Only you can satisfy my soul. Only you can satisfy my heart. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Only you can satisfy my heart only you can satisfy my soul only you can satisfy my heart Jesus Jesus yes Lord Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We want more of you, Lord. More of your presence. More of your glory. More of your presence. More of your glory. More of your presence. More of your glory. You make my life so beautiful And as you are You have made me Do you know the song? Can you sing it? There's nothing greater than this That's why I love you Forevermore Why I love you. That's why I love you. Forevermore. Forevermore. Oh, you make my life. You make my life so beautiful. And as you are, you have made me your love. Beautiful, and as you, oh, and as you are, you are made me. There's nothing greater, there's nothing greater than me. That's why I love you, that's why I love you forevermore. Yeah. I want more of you, Jesus. I want more of you, Jesus. The more I know you, the more I want to know you, Jesus. More of you, more. More of you, hey. and Jesus, more of you, hey. more of you, hey. more of you, hey. more of you, deeper. Jesus, I wanna know you more. I wanna know you more. I 
want to love you more. Caesar, 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 Let me know you, Jesus. word from which we were drawn father lord we give you praise thank you for bringing us to this day thank you for the things you've ordained to do with us in this week father lord we yield to you 
we ask that you have your way lord speak to us by your spirit this afternoon let your word be clear let your word be simple let there be understanding in the hearts of men and let your name be glorified may your word be profitable to direct may your word produce and may all the glory come to you thank you god of heaven in jesus mighty name we have prayed hallelujah praise the lord glory to jesus somebody should please help me beg mark Mordi to stop preaching my message exactly what does he want me to say now hallelujah we're still in the series the journey if you're joining us online welcome this is the well oasis international and this is our main service and i have an echo and i do not know why hallelujah we're in the series the journey and this is our tenth installment last week we looked at the difference we saw that while we all have been called to follow God, do his will, and deliver on our mandate, we were called, we were created with difference, and God has called us to live out of what we can call the mark of difference in us. It was clear that the capacity to thrive in difference is hinged on the confidence and the wisdom he who made us as we are, in the wisdom he who made us as we are made us so that we can achieve what is in his heart we encouraged ourselves last week to deal with the insecurity that manifests as a craving for acceptance to run from the comparison from comparison because it kills our genius we were want to watch out for how the enemy seeks and plus, plots to blur the lines that point to our difference by advocating sameness because he wants to destroy the greatness that our difference can birth and does indeed birth. We looked at Joseph and Daniel and we, who stood in their difference and literally conquered their word for kingdom. As we move on today, we want to focus on some other element of the journey. And today we're talking about the diet. Hallelujah. Amen. We're talking about the diet. Hallelujah. Amen. As we move on today, you find out that there is plenty that has your maturity and your capacity to fulfill mandate have to do with what you feed on. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, if you're an RV traveler or even if you're an occasional traveler, if you've ever traveled by train and, or may, and by plane, what you find, and sometimes even in some luxury buses, you'll find out that the classes of tickets differ, yes? The classes of, diff, of tickets differ. If you're traveling by train, you'll find out that some of those coaches, that when you enter them, depending on the ticket you have, they serve refreshments. And in others, they just let you be. And then there are some coaches you enter, and it is written boldly on the wall, quiet zone. It's different. The number of people in that coach is less. And then they expect you to act according to the decorum or the protocol of that coach. Hallelujah. Now, what I find when you travel and you find yourself in any of these classes is that you have paid for the ticket to be able to enjoy what the, the class um, offers. Am I correct? Okay, so I have, if you fly by plane and you were privileged to be able to afford a business class ticket, there are a few things in the few times I have traveled that I have seen. The first thing I see, especially when you are on an international route, is that your business class ticket grants you access to the lounge, yes? The lounge is somewhere that has been prepared comfortable with refreshments where you can chill until your flight is called. So when you fly business and you find yourself with a business class ticket, you find yourself, you, at the point of check-in, they say to you that, oh, that you are entitled 
to show up at the lounge, isn't it? So you find yourself looking for the lounge and you get there. When you get to the lounge, they will ask for your boarding pass. The moment you show them your boarding pass and they click it in and they see that indeed you bought a business class ticket, they welcome you. If you're a man and you're wearing a jacket, they ask you if you want your coats to be taken. They sit you down and they either come and take your order for what you might want with a menu or there is a buffet, there is a spread somewhere and they say to you, oh, this is this and this is that. You can go there and take whatever you want. Now, if you go to some really fantastic lounges, what you find is that sometimes what you want has to be prepared a la carte. So you pick them and you go back to sit down. You have Wi-Fi password. You want to watch TV. It's available. There's so many comforts. Your chairs are not club club seats, you know, are not uh, those. They are proper, really nice lounges. So you sit down, lounging chairs. So you sit down and they bring your meal to you. At these lounges, lounges, you don't only get cold cuts. You can get a warm meal while you wait for your flight. Hallelujah. Now, something else that buying a business class ticket at, um, um, gives you or you have gives you access to is something called priority boarding. When you have a business class ticket, when you show up at the gate, in fact, if you are flying some airlines, they already have a designated line for those who are flying business, business class and above. So it's called priority boarding. It means that when you come and there's this line around the block, you don't necessarily have to join the queue. You can actually come up straight and go up to the head of the queue and say, I'm flying business and they will board you. Hallelujah. It's part of the cost of your ticket. All of these services. As a matter of fact, I remember, Shola, I don't know if you remember those days, Virgin will actually give you a limo service when you arrive in Heathrow. If you bought a business class ticket and you arrive in Heathrow, they will bring you the limo to you as you come out and it takes you wherever you are headed. And when you have checked in and you are returning, the same car service comes to get you. When you get there, they don't ask you anything. You don't need to present anything. As you arrive, they are handing you your boarding pass. They are taking your bags and you are going straight to the lounge. All of this is built into what? Your business class ticket. When you fly some other flights like Delta, for instance, when you arrive at your destination, especially when you arrive in Nigeria, I've noticed that if you fly business, as you come off the uh, passport control, they say to you, they will identify you and they will say, please come with me. They will take you to a lounge again. I mean, you're coming back, they put you in a lounge and they don't let you go through the hassle of looking for your luggage. When your luggage is found, they come to you and they say, we found your luggage. It's been stacked on a cart and someone will push the luggage with you until you find your car. <laughs> Hallelujah. But all these things are wonderful. But for me, the most enjoyable part of being able to fly business, and don't think I fly it every day, yes? This is like one in a green moon, yes? But the most enjoyable part of flying business for me is the dining, the in-flight dining. When you fly business, when you get on the plane, you can understand why those who are foodies and food aficionados will say to you that the food that dining is not just the eating it is the entire experience if you're flying economy on the same flight at best they give you a foil pack and plastic cutlery yes and they give you paper towels or serviettes if they are nice but if you're flying business class and above when you show up your cutlery is fine your crockery is fine everything is properly taken care of it's thought through yes they ask they don't give you paper napkins they give you cloth napkins they give you a full tray as a matter of fact when you come in and you sit down someone walks up to you and asks you would you like some water some juice or some wine from that point on your journey starts yes and if you are lucky and the um the person in your cabin maybe the crew in your cabin are extra nice and you know how to eat and drink every like one hour especially if you're not asleep they show up and they ask you would you like anything else 
When you are flying business at the head, at the bulk head, if you just come out and you walk to the bulk head, you will see an array of pastry. You can just go there and take and get yourself a drink if you didn't see a crew around. So you don't fly with your tummy growling. The food is nice. It is never the same food as economy. Pay attention to me. And they actually give you a menu. The options may not be a spread, but they give you a menu and they say to you, there is this, and you see the first course, the main, the entree, and then uh, the, 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 the afters. And then you can pick what you want to eat, and they will go and bring it. And when your meal gets to you, it's actually hot. So you find that when you're flying business, the experience is different. But like I said, the best part of it is that in-flight dining for me. Because in case you have no head, clean food is horrible. But once you buy the business class ticket, somehow, you know, they are able to, I don't know how they are able to find those really nice food. That really nice food that doesn't make it across the curtain. So economy, I have no idea. But I think I have an idea. Because usually every business class ticket is like four times the cost of your economy class ticket. So all of this experience is built in. Sister B, are we talking about diet or we're talking about flying? You will soon understand the conversation. So if you fly on, at that class, what you find is that you get this particular kind of dining experience. Your food is different because you paid for it. Yes? And I'm saying that on this journey, we are looking at the diet. There is a kind of food that entails that um, uh, empowers you to continue to journey with God to the point that you fulfill your mandate. And so if you are journeying with God and you decide to journey on an economy class ticket, and if you decide to journey on a business class ticket, it determines what you are fed. Now the thing about what you are fed is that what you paid determines what you are fed. Is someone looking at it, listening to me? Now let's even bring it a little bit lower to what we probably all know. Let's talk about mothers. When you have your child, those of you who do, um, what's that? Breastfeeding only. Fam uh, baby friendly, that's what it's called, right? Exclusive breastfeeding. You'll find out that if you decide to do nine months or one year of exclusive breastfeeding, your child only takes breast milk, breast milk in that time, yes? Takes only breast milk in that time. Now I have found out and I know as a matter of fact that the Breast milk contains every nutrient that a child requires at that age of his life. But by the time you get to like eight months, if you're not, if you decide to now introduce some other kind of food, you are expected to introduce cereals, yes? Now, for my children, the cereal that my children ate, the ones that ate cereals, I think all of them actually did, was friso cream in those days. But if you remember, they will not allow you to introduce the wheat or the corn until you have done rice. So the child will begin with rice frizzle cream or a rice because it's easier for the child's digestive system to handle. And maybe from like six months, if the child is fast to eat. And then when the child gets to like eight, nine months, you will now introduce the... Um, the wheat or the corn, yes? And then it becomes another dining experience for the child. But the reason why you start with breast milk and then maybe you start with um, formula and you go on to rice cereal before you go on to wheat cereals is because the child is developing and what the child can handle as a matter of their development is what the child will be fed. It is why you don't take a three-month-old child and begin to feed the child apple. Do you understand it? Because the child can't handle it yet. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. I saw that some people were complaining about their diet. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. 
It says, this was Paul responding to the church in Corinth. Let me background it for you. The church in Corinth were complaining. They were like, Paul, Paul's teaching and the messages he brings to them were too simple. They were trying to discredit Paul and the message he's brought. They thought that when they say that the message was too simplistic, it might be to, it might, um, 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 it's enough or sufficient to discredit Paul, to either determine that Paul did not understand theology properly, or that Paul was not even sent on this errand at all. They started to compel Paul to Roman and Greek philosophers, whose line of teaching and argument was always convoluted and confusing. They didn't understand why Paul would bring them a message. I mean, they're in the church. And Paul's message was still very simple and rudimentary. So they were complaining. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul responded to them. In verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, but not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? But while one said, I am of Paul, and another am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planted anything, neither is he that watereth, but God giveth the increase. Now he that planted and he that watereth and won, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his, his labor. For we are laborers together with God, Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse number 10. According to the grace which God is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Hallelujah. So verse 1 to 5, when they were complaining that Paul's message was too simple, Paul said to them, that's the only thing you can handle. And I can tell your immaturity because of the squabbles that are around you. There is envy, there is strife, there are arguments. How can you guys be arguing over who planted, who watered? How can you begin to say, I belong to Apollos? I what is Apollos Jesus? Is Paul Jesus? Why are there functions amongst you? And yet you say to me that you are mature enough to eat meat. Oh no, you are not. Your action, your output suggests that your digestive system is not enough to hold meat. So therefore, will we continue to feed you milk? Shh. Essentially, Paul just dissed the church in Corinth. By saying to them, you are not even ready yet. They can't deploy you for anything. Because you are still holding conversations that children and babes in Christ should hold. Sister B, we are talking about diet. Yes, let me break it down and get, take it to the end. Then maybe I'll walk you through the in-between. What you feed determines your maturity. And your maturity determines your fulfillment of mandate. What you feed on determines your maturity. Your maturity determines your capacity to fulfill mandate. Paul said to them, number one, I could not speak to you as a spiritual people, but as babes in Christ. Number two, because you were babes, I fed you milk and not meat. Number three, you could not bear to be fed milk at this stage. Because of your output. Number four, your output was carnal. There was envy. There was strife. There were divisions. 
You were choosing sides. All of these manifestations of insecurity, surely if you were mature enough and you had been fed the right, if you were eating the right food, you will not be acting like a child. <laughs> Then I saw, that was why I said Pastor Mark was preaching my message. First Peter chapter 2. I want to show you something. First Peter chapter 2 verse 2. It says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Again, it reiterates what it was that I said. Babes are filled with what? Milk. What you should note is that they complained about the quality of the messages that Paul and Paul drew out a parallel, a parallel with their maturity. Paul said, if I brought you anything harder, you couldn't handle it. Because the way you are acting right now is indicative of the fact that you are not strong enough to take anything harder. So I will deal with you with the basic of the principles of kingdom. Hallelujah. Amen. When in Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, both in verse 4, the, the devil took Jesus, you know, met Jesus in the wilderness after his 40-day fast and decided to tempt Jesus. He said to Jesus, he said to Jesus, he said, um, um, turn these stones into bread. Jesus took a look at him and said to him, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Yes? So bread was food. Am I correct? And the devil was talking to Jesus about bread and Jesus responded with what? The word. I'm talking to you about diet. I'm not making a mistake at all. They were like, he was like, Turn this, if you know you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. Jesus looked at him and said, Shoo. Man shall not live by bread alone now. We, we are eating something higher. You just don't know about it. We don't feed on these ones only. So you may think that I have fasted 40 days and I'm hungry. But the reality is I'm full of the word of God. The point is that food is symbolic of God's word. Or God's word is symbolic of food. And your maturity determines the quality of food that will that your diet will consist of. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. I want to read to you verse 12 to 14. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 to 14. It says, For when the time, for when for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need. That one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Paul was saying to them, you were supposed to be the first oracles of God. But what do I see you do? You are needing teaching. It means that you've been binging on milk. And if you've been binging on milk, you cannot be skilled enough to exercise yourself. In the word of righteousness. <laughs> now you see why the church of Jesus Christ is malnourished. We go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, four times on Sunday. But what we are feeding does not have the capacity to sustain you. You are an adult. Stop drinking Cerelac or Similac. Cerelac is even high for some people. Similac. The way every time you go to church, you are looking for someone to say, Hey, receive. That's the only reason you show up in church. Ah, it is coming to you. Take your car. They've been saying it to you for 25 years. You have no strategy. You are not productive. So, car has not manifested. Shouldn't you go somewhere else where they'll tell you something else? 
You are happy because milk makes you feel good. Milk does not make you uncomfortable. Ah, it's milk now. Milk is, even as an adult, I used to drink milk. You know how it is now? I don't know whether you did it too. Nan, it was me and Kenichi that were drinking the Nan together. Uh, he was drinking, I was eating. When I make his bottle, I will pour some in my mouth. It was tasty. But do you know as his mother, it was useful for him, but it was not doing me any good. Beyond the fact that it was sweet in my taste buds. How many of us can testify? <laughs> Hallelujah. You did it too. All of us. <laughs> Even the daddies that were eating it behind our back. <laughs> Confession time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. For the child, none was important. Once you fed the child a bottle of naan, the child is so full that he falls asleep. For the adult, if you like, put the entire, chug the entire can. You will still be hungry. You need a bar. You need rice. You need a mala. You need pandadiam. You know the things that you should eat. So as a believer, if you are chugging, and you are supposed to be mature already, if you are still chugging naan, Paul says, in Hebrews, he says, you are on Healed. He said you cannot exercise your senses to discern both good and evil. Ha! That's already too tough, yes? That's what the thing I'm talking about milk now. This is not what people should be telling us. We came to church to be told that we will make it even when they can see we are not making it. Nobody wants to tell you guys you bought a one-way ticket to hell because it's not politically correct. How will you come into church and expect political correct conversation? But that's what we do. We don't want the people not to come. So we tell them what they want to hear. The Bible says they have itchy ears. They show up where they, they think that they want to hear is what is said. The problem is how they were in 1945 is how they are in 2022. Nothing has changed. Pastor said we come to God to receive an upgraded mind. How does your mind? He told us, he said the mind upgrade happens by the word of God. When you are still looking at kindergarten word, ordinary ten commandments is messing you up. How are you going to receive an upgraded mind to be able to exercise your mind to know the difference between good and evil? Your diet is important. What are you feeding on? In John chapter 6, I know I have a lot of scriptures today, but this teaching is kind of roundabout, and unless I, I show you the scriptures, you may go away feeling offended. So I decided that I will take my time today, and I will take you through all the scriptures. It's not my thing, but I'll take you through every one, and I will read it to you. I won't just cite it. I want you to see it. In John chapter 6, the Jews were talking to Jesus. This was Jesus. Jesus was talking to them, rather. His disciples, and here it was a large number of disciples, and he was telling them stuff. Listen to me from verse 52 of John chapter 6. He says, the Jews therefore strove among themselves. Do you see that word again? Strive. Once there are babies, they will strive. Once there, is, there are babies, you can, and this person said, that person did not say. The things that we ought to show up in the room and just say, okay, that's just walk away from it and let's focus on where we're going it is important for babes to sit down and judge the matter who said what who didn't say? inside church do i have time i will quickly tell you sorry i move on so jesus was talking to them said the jews therefore strove among themselves saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat jesus was speaking in parables they were Having a meltdown. And all they could see is Jesus is a cannibal. He wants to feed us his flesh. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man. He said it again. And drink his blood. You have no life in you. 
Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, shoe, and my blood is drinking indeed. He that eateth my the thing was offending them. Jesus was saying it over and over. For those who people said that Jesus was he's a lamb, but he's also the lion. He says, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna. Did I not say to you that the food determines your capability? He says, not are your fathers who did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. This thing said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? I want you to go back again. Many, therefore, not a few, many, therefore, of his disciples, not of the crowd, his disciples, they looked at themselves and said, this is too hard. Who can stay here and continue to listen to this? Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said to them, doth this offend you? <laughs> what and if you shall see the son of man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickened. The flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some that, do not be that believe not. I want you to just go with me to verse number. Let me even just read it. It says, For Jesus knew the, from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore I said, therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my father. Verse 66. Look at it, whether it's in your Bible. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Many of his disciples complained. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You are on a journey with God. You will get to some things that God will bring you to. Eh? And you have only two choices. Choice number one, to die. Choice number two, to go back. May you not draw back. In Jesus' name. In verse 67, I thought that Jesus would be upset that his congregation are leaving. He turns to the ones that are left. He says, then Jesus said unto the twelve. That is, they had gone, he remained only twelve. And then he turned to the twelve and he said to them, will you also go away? There's something that Jesus knew and that we need to know today. Jesus knew that carrying to, to be top heavy in babes in Christ, spiritual babes, is deadly. Jesus knew that it was better than they left, than they stayed around him and surrounded him and looked like he had something around him, but one prick of the needle, poof, Everything is deflated because they are full of milk. The truth is that even today, people are not open to learning, to hearing truth. If, because it is hard. We don't want to be told truth. It is too hard, we say. We act like God has called us to a straw in the park. We act like the call to journey with God is one of convenience. Every day, we refuse to see that God invested his best in us. We fail to embrace the thinking and the reasoning that God requires that we profit by the investment he's made in our lives. 
who will take the best thing that he has and invest it and, and not require a profit. When Jesus in Luke, I believe it was Luke um, 10, 19, when he said to his disciples, he said, occupy till I come. In some version or translation, it says, do business till I come. You were not put here just to scream, I am a blessed child. That's not why you were put here. You were put here according to Genesis chapter 128 to produce what will bring the kingdom into the place of dominion again. So, if that is, according to pastor today, if that is the goal, then what you are feeding on will determine whether you have the muscle to deliver the goal. So, Years ago, I said it to one congregation. I said, there are too many Kwashoko Christians here. So you are malnourished. If they took you to a children's hospital, they will put you under a light amongst many other things because you are just malnourished. You are either yellowy or something, or your tummy is big or something because you're feeding on just the same thing over and over and over any attempt to change your diet you scream it is instructive to note that even in john chapter 6 the people responded to hard saying by living i mean jesus was standing in front of them Jesus was the one speaking. They got angry and they started to leave. Said, this one is too hard. Though. I mean, I didn't, I didn't get born again to be told this kind of hard thing. No. no. I thought they said that this Jesus builds houses for people. If that's not the conversation, let me just go back where I'm coming from. They left. And it is also instructed that Jesus did not say, hey, please don't go. Jesus did not change his message. Instead, he turned to the ones that were saying, oh, now they go to. And Peter answered in verse 68 of John chapter 6, he said, to whom shall we go? Until your conversation or your question becomes, to whom shall I go? You are not ready to feed enough to deliver on what God has called you to. As I pondered, I realized that on the journey with God, I cannot afford to draw back. Because I'm unable to embrace my instructions via the word, which is my spiritual food. In Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15 and 16, I want to establish for you again that the word of God is the food of the spirit. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15 and 16. It says, and I will give you pastors, pay attention, according to my heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Are pastors cooks? Are they chefs? Do pastors run restaurants? What do they feed you with? And then in verse 16, he says something. He said, and it shall come to pass. When you be multiplied and increased in the land, in those days said the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind. Neither shall they remember it. Neither shall they visit it. Neither shall that be done anymore. He said, when you allow, when are you, I choose the pastors who will feed you and bring you to a place of knowledge and understanding. When they begin to feed you, he said you will increase and you will be multiplied. And what will happen is nobody will no, long, no one will long, any longer say to their brother, God is in that place, let us go. Because we... The understanding will bring you to the understanding, uh, the teaching, the knowledge and the understanding will bring you to the place of realization that God is within. Do you understand this? But they didn't say it will happen by laying on of hands. They did not say it will happen by vigils. They said it will happen by what you eat. No wonder it says then um, faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. Everything you will produce will come by a word. And that is your diet. 
So bring it together slightly. It's not even going to be a long word. Let's take a look at what food does. I just typed advantages or benefits of food to the body. The first thing Google threw up is what I wrote here. It's not even that deep. It says food helps you to live longer. That's the first thing he said. He said it keeps your skin, your teeth, and your eyes healthy. That's what Google said. Google said food supports the growth of your muscles. Google said food boosts immunity. immunity. He said food strengthens your bones. <laughs> he says food lowers the risk of disease. He said food supports the body to function whether for reproduction or for digestion or whatever it is food that supports your body to do what your body needs to do these are some of the things that they say is the benefit of food now i want you to flip it and notice that when you have the word of god in you it can be the reason you live longer It can be the reason you are not afflicted by the disease of the skin. <laughs> I'm like, somebody like that. Are you saying? I didn't say anything. I'm just telling you what I saw. Muscle. How do you lift? How do you carry? How do you determine? Uh, how do you um, reproduce or bring yourself to bring forth the things that God has called you to bring forth? By the muscle that you have. And the saying that the word of God strengthens your muscles. It says it strengthens your bones. No wonder he said about Jesus, he said not one of his bones shall be broken. And they checked it, not one of his bones were broken. I don't know whether you understand that. Let me explain it to you. Those days when they would hang someone, they would, well, number one, hang them upside down. But so that he would die on time, they would break parts of his limbs so that he can die on time. In Jesus' time, they didn't need to break anything. He just gave up the ghost. The Bible said he gave up the ghost. The Bible did not say it was taken from him. He gave it up. And God's word that said not one of his bones will be broken. Despite the kind of death that he went through, not one of them was broken. <laughs> you need to read your Bible, man. If you read it, you will, you will see something. What I can tell is that all food all in all, food brings sustenance to the natural body. Which means that spiritual food does about the same thing for our spiritual lives. Now, if as we grow physically, our diet changes with time. Why would we not make the effort to ensure that we feed on the right food for the right season of our maturity? There was a time that you could eat serious carbs at midnight. And by the next morning, when you run back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you're, there, there's nothing that we, you can't, when you go up the stairs three times when you're past 60, you want to take a break. But when you're in your 20s and your 30s, you can do that like 30 times a day. And it does not even, in fact, by 7.30 a.m., you're hungry again. And you ate Eba the previous 12 a.m. Why is that so? Because your body has the capacity to burn it faster than when your metabolism begins to slow down. Now, even for the word of God, there are assignments and there are seasons of your life you get to. And you know, you know, you know that the word of last season cannot help now. You better drill deep. Oh, man. They will use you as corn beef. Our diet changes with us. Why would we not make the effort to ensure that spiritually we feed on the right thing for the season that we are in? The equation in my spirit is something like this. Food is to the body what the word is to the spirit. Your diet determines your physical growth. 
as the quality and the quantity of the word of God that you take determines your spiritual growth. This intake that is your diet determines our maturity. And our maturity determines what responsibility we can take on. Responsibility is how we fulfill mandate. Therefore, if, I, if this was a logic and critical thinking class, therefore, therefore, your food determines how you fulfill mandate. Question again. What are you feeding on? In one sentence, your diet determines the, your capacity to fulfill mandate. What are you doing? What's your word intake like? What's your word intake like? How will I quote John chapter 6 to you and you take my word for it? Why would you not go home and open it and check it for yourself? Or you don't know that sometimes we quote scriptures and they are wrong? Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 verse 10 and 11. It says, But the brethren immediately sent Paul and si away, and Silas by Paul sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Verse 12 says, Therefore, many of them believed. Also, honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. The Berean Christians did not take Paul's word for it. Why the ones in Corinth were busy striving and complaining about the quality of the word and about uh, what faction they belonged to, the Berean Christians opened their Bible. Number one, they received the word with gladness, the Bible say. They, they were excited that they were bringing the word to them. Have you ever seen where people, the moment the word starts, they fall asleep? Have you seen it? If you are an instrumentalist here, maybe if you just joined us. But the first thing I announce to instrumentalists is, I don't want to see you outside when they are preaching. Because it's the disease that instrumentalists and the music, I don't know. Once the word starts, it, starts, it looks like something lights a fire on their head and they begin to go out. So when you are looking for fornication, it's in their midst. When you are looking for people who are cutting corners in there. So when they come here, the first thing I say, sit your tush where you should be. Hear the word. Because the word is how you are refined. Do you understand this conversation? Do you understand it? What the Berean did was they spread their hand. And no, I'm not saying you guys are like that because you sit down. Then I'm looking at David. He's taking notes. I... I don't have it here because we don't quarrel. That with the main fact that we're not quarreling is because you're not like that. Do you understand it? The Bereans received the word with gladness. They were excited that finally they were opening the scriptures and somebody was bringing the word. Then they said that they received it with all readiness of mind. And then they search the scriptures. When they finish on Sunday, daily, they go back. And they were searching the scriptures, not only because they wanted to read for themselves. They wanted to be sure that what they were told in church was true. It's the reason why they are, they are abusing people in church. And they don't even know that they are being abused. Because they, they don't even own a Bible, let alone open it. The only Bible they own is the one their mother used to put under their pillow. Where it was open to Psalm 91. Now they are 40. The Bible is still open to Psalm 91 under their pillow. What does Psalm 91 say? They don't know. 
But the Bereans were not like that. And because the Bereans searched the scripture to ascertain whether what they heard was, was the one, the Bible said many of them believed. Many of them believed. I imagine that it was beyond belief because it talked about honorable women. There was a transformation happening in the church in Berea. It was different because these people, it's one thing to bring the word to you. It's another thing for you to accept or embrace it. The Bereans had the recipe right. The diet for our journey with and in God consists of his word and more of his word. We cannot be believers who do not give the word a pride of place. Someone would have thought that when I said the diet, I was going to go to Daniel and talk about how Daniel chose not. No. This is the real food. This is the real food. How do I know? Because I've heard testimonies of people who stood on the word of God. And they, in fact, I've seen it. If, not, if I say I've heard, it's too far. I've seen it happen. Where someone, all they did was, in fact, my friend's brother just received healing from pancreatic cancer. When he fell, when he was diagnosed, the doctor, the Holy Spirit said to him, stay with the word. He stayed with the word. The more he stayed with the word, the more his health deteriorated. The more he stayed with the word, the more his health deteriorated. Finally, one day, they forced him to go to the hospital. When they got to the hospital, they did the test, and they said that something that was supposed to be 3%, his own was 200 and something. He was a walking corpse. So he turned to the people, his family who, and said to them, Shibi, I told you people that God said I should stay in the world. Now doctors say they can't do anything. Can we go home now? So they gave him a drip to stabilize him and they sent him back home. They sent him home to die. He went back into his room. His siblings would take turns. This is a Nephi's brother, so this is not far. His siblings, one week in, one week out. When they get there, they are not doing anything. They will open the word of God with him. They will speak the word. They will speak it together. They were reading, and they were reading the word together, and they were reading together. Small, by small, by small, by small. It was like magic. I think that that hospital trip, the Lord made them go so that we can, they can prove that the word of God works. By the time they were done, Jesus, the person who couldn't sit up was driving his wife to the airport. And as we speak, he is fine. The doctors don't understand it, but the word of God brought it to him. But you see, it wasn't pastors that were gathering to speak the word over him. He by himself opened the Bible. They said when the thing would come and he would feel like he was dying, he would muster all the energy and he would begin to scream the word of God out. And God was true to his word. So when he says the word of God is health to your body, the, the Bible even says so. It says, my word is a lamp unto your feet and to your path. By your by word of God, your bones are made healthy. But when you don't know, which one would you use? He said, concerning the works of my hands, command you with me. He says, bring my word back to me. But you don't know it so, the devil will continue to dance. If I did not give you anything in 2022, let it be that I told you to sit with your word. The stupendous prim promises that God is giving us in this place for 2022. But I'm sure I told you that it begins with a word. I'm sure I told you that. It's not, it's not catch blank. That one is not a blank check. You don't just go and say, and then uh, Pastor B said, that is the year of my harvest. I never come and I never will say, Paul, I know. Pastor B, I know. Jesus, I know you. Who you be? We cannot be believers who do not give the word of God 
a pride of place in our lives. My husband many years ago said that there are five ways to engage with the word of God. You can read the word of God. You can study the word of God. Apparently they are different. Reading it, you can read it like a novel. You can study it to know the contextual um, reason why a certain word was put there. Then he said you can meditate on the word of God. So it's different to study than it is to meditate. Then he said you can investigate the word of God. Which was what the Bereans did. They read it and they read it daily to ascertain whether the things that they were told were were so and then my husband says the fifth way to use the word of God to engage with the word of God is to apply it read it study it meditate on it investigate it apply it I don't know if this happens to anybody but I read the same word one month apart and the revelation is different I'm like guy no wonder you see what they say you hear the expression his mercies are new every morning everybody thinks that is the car so you bought um pojo yesterday you buy honda tomorrow it is the revelation the pastor called this something today he said redemptive revelation the strength and wholeness of your journey is determined and hinged on your diet that is your word intake i like the word of god i like to read it raw from the bible then depending on the season that i'm in i am in there's some weird ministers i listen to because their take on the word of god is exactly that weird then when i finish listening to them i go back to the holy spirit and i'm like okay now sit with me let's see how we would deconstruct and reconstruct the word of God and so you find that when you deal with the word of God at that level no matter what stands in front of you you are not shaking your stability is secure in the word because in case you do not know open your Bible there is a word for everything you can deal with absolutely everything those who make room for the word and obey it have an edge <laughs> and an assurance that they will make it till the end. The question is, where does the word feature in your life? On your priority list, where is the place of the word? People say, I don't read it because I don't understand it. You see, this is not head knowledge. Before you open the word of God, what you ought to do is invite Holy Spirit. And say, Holy Spirit, I'm about to read now. I would need you to explain to me. And you don't need to read King James because King James makes you feel like and sound like you are a believer. Read the message. Pick the language that you can understand. And then with time, you find yourself growing. To be a believer who doesn't open his Bible is to never find the treasure that God is hid in the field. I have a book. I call it Treasures in Plain Sight. Tips. That's what um, tips is about. The reason why tips is pre pre treasures in plain sight is because from very everyday common word, you find and distill a principle that you can run with for your life. Antonia said to me today, she said, even if you're not a believer, if you read, if you don't get sense before, if you read building blocks, you will get sense. Do you understand this conversation? But we are acting like you, you want to be spoon fed. I come here and I give you 45 minutes of word and you are dancing. Have you not thought about it that if I'm able to stand here and not shake and give you 45 minutes, one hour, that I have at least 15 hours stored on the inside of me? If I have 15 hours and I gave you one hour, what is the ratio? Think about it. On this subject matter, I could go on for days, but I mean, we are in a series. I can't sit with this forever. So I give you one hour worth of it. Your job is to go back and take it apart like the Bereans. Sister B said this one, so me, I have to find out what. That's the way we grow. 
That's the way God can entrust things into your hands. You are angry that nobody is calling you. You think the people who are appointing people don't see? They can see. Who wants to entrust another destiny to a struggling destiny? Who? Except the person is clueless, not me. And then to end it. That was why I was just shaking, shaking my head when Pastor Mark was going on and on and on and on and on about my message. He was supposed to talk about strategies. He to talk about the word of God. The question was, where does the word of God factor or feature on your journey? And before you answer it, I will commend to you 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 23. That's why I thought, guy, did you read my notes? Sorry, no, I think it will be verse 3. This is, is 1 Peter 2. Um? Yes, that's what I'm saying. I think it's verse 3. Let me see. Yes. Um, what is not up to? The scripture I'm looking for is that scripture that Pastor Mark was talking about. One, sorry, it's not two. Yes. Okay, I wrote two. I wrote two. 123. There's 123. What are you opening now, guy? Are you here? First Peter 123. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The point that I'm making is this word of God that I'm commending to you today. That it's what you need to feed on if you want to excel on the journey with you does not die. It not only lives forever, it abides forever. This word of God is, cannot be corrupted. The Bible as a matter of fact says heaven and earth may pass away. But the word of God will remain. The people who teach you the word will die. Somebody's like, God forbid, I know, okay, grow. A day is going to come. And the ones who used to teach us and those of us who teach the word, we will die. We will die. And if Jesus starts, we'll leave the word here. And it will still be doing its work after we are long dead and gone. Even you who's been taught the word, that you're taking it and you're absorbing it and you're using it. After a while, you will die and leave the word here. And it does not need to be a revised edition. As we're studying building blocks, I'm already revising it. The next print will be a revised edition already. But the Bible, no need to revise the edition. It's the same yesterday, it's the same today and forever. The Bible says that the word of God is breathed by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Why are we on this journey? Is it not to excel? Is it not to um, establish the will of God in the earth as it is in heaven? I'm saying that you can't do that if you are not full of the word of God. I know this is not exciting enough for you today. Because what I just came to do was put more work on your plate. Last week was better when I was saying you had this difference. All of you were jumping. Even me too, I was jumping. The word... It means that you have to open something. It means that if you, those of you that can't see, but because you don't read, you have not been wearing glasses. You now need to go and get your glasses because you must read this word of God. Study it. Meditate on it. Investigate it. Then more importantly, apply it. You want to go somewhere this year? That is how to do it. It's the way to do it. You cannot coast on the crumbs from my table. Because as great as you think this is, is the crumbs from my table. Because there are things I know by this particular subject matter that I can't even process into words for you. 
And there will be a, I'm sure that if you went and you sat with it, there are things that were done on you that you can't process into words, but they will become cornerstones for you to excel in all that God has called you to. Brethren, don't leave the word at home. Do not leave it at home. All that you would ever be is locked up in a word of God somewhere. Somewhere. Just open it. If someone told me that I would read, um, it was Jeremiah 31, 22. How long will thou guard about, O daughter of Zion? Behold, the Lord has created a new thing. A woman shall encompass a man. If God, someone told me I would read that one verse of Bible and my life would change forever, I would never have believed it. Never. That one scripture is still bringing forth today, over 20 something years later. That one scripture. Just engaging with scripture continued to open my eyes and I continued to see things that I did not even know existed in God. Then one day God said, just read Genesis 1. And this is over 10 years now. I can't believe that I will not go a week without alluding to Genesis chapter 1. I can't believe it. The word of God, powerful. How much of it do you know? I want to close by saying to you, this is not memorizing. This is not a recitation. This is about allowing the word to become flesh. That is, you deal with it, you sit on the word, so tell, it has a meaning for you, specifically that it doesn't have for anybody else. They said to Jesus, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And then they turned back and they left. And Jesus looked at the remaining ones of them and said, will you leave also? But the Bereans came and they heard the word. The Bible says they received it with gladness of spirit. And then they went and they searched the scriptures daily. Because they wanted to prove if the word were so. And because of that they grew and they were added to the church. I want you to stand on your feet. And I think we should believe, begin with a repentance and say, Father, I repent for not giving your word the pride of place in my life. If you would not go through days without eating, it is a sin to go through days without engaging with the word of God. If you will not go days without eating food, it is it is deadly to go days without engaging with the word of god repent father lord i am sorry that i do not give the word the pride of place that i ought to give it in my life i repent today help me that i may give the word the pride of place that it deserves in my life and if you have not even gotten to that point you that means you've not given your life to jesus whether you're in this room or you're out there could you say with me, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Because the word of God will make a difference. But it's the spirit of God on the inside of you that helps you make sense of the word when you read it. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Brethren, find how the word works for you. My husband is the person who reads the Bible from page to page. He starts in Genesis, he ends in Revelation. If I tried it, I will not survive. So I read as the Holy Spirit leads me and sometimes by subject matter is how I read. You don't need to have a reading plan. You just need to have Holy Spirit. Begin by just opening it. The one that's troubled you. Did you hear what pastor said? He said there's a word that's been running around in my head. It's been troubling me. I already know that he will sit with it until he meals whatever is in it in this season for him. Brethren, don't let me lie to you. Do not let anyone fool you. Your growth will be stunted if you don't engage the word by yourself. Pray this evening and say, Father, I receive grace to give words 
roam in my life. I receive grace to give your word priority in my life. I receive grace to engage with your word like I know that my life depends on it. Help me, O oh God. Help me, O oh God. If you will give 5% of the time you used to engage in hustling for money to the word of God, you would have to to hustle 95% less because where you are seated the Lord will give you one idea and it will be a money spinner for a long time Father Lord help us as a church help us as individuals help us as families help us teach us oh God how to give your word the priority that it deserves in our lives father lord we thank you we give you all the praise thank you for your word thank you for your word thank you for your word to you be all the glory oh god in jesus mighty name amen and amen god bless you